What exactly is causing the outbreak to escalate the way it has? Well, you know, as many people have mentioned, these swarms look almost biblical. Fruit bats in plague numbers have descended on a Queensland town, bringing unbearable smell, noise and mess, leaving residents at their wit's end. The situation's become even more serious after the problem prevented a helicopter carrying a patient from landing at the hospital. It almost looks apocalyptic, fruit bats in their hundreds of thousands, blanketing the evening sky. This is a day in the life for the residents of Ingham. These extraordinary videos were taken by locals during a roosting season. Unless you're here and seeing it, it is incredible. We shouldn't be living like this. East Africa is facing its worst locust outbreak in 70 years, with Kenya hit particularly hard. Billions of locusts are swarming across the continent. Among the more unsettling images of the week past, a literal plague of locusts, billions of them, ravaging Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia in East Africa. The locusts are devouring crops and threatening the food supply of millions. Experts at the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization say the current invasion of desert locusts in Eastern Africa is the worst in Ethiopia and Somalia in 25 years and the worst in Kenya in 70 years. The FAO estimates one of the swarms currently over Kenya covers an area of about 2,400 square kilometers and may contain as many as 200 billion locusts. You can see in this video just how massive the locust swarms have been across the region. These bugs have infested farmland and destroyed crops. Farmers are calling on the international community to help prevent a food crisis. As a matter of fact, we, still, uh, we are still having rains in Kenya, which is very unusual for this time of the year. And, uh, and all of this creates uh, these very favorable conditions. Uh, Mr. Ferrand, the situation has been going on for several weeks. We've mentioned it already several times here on Ion Africa, uh, even since November in some parts of the continent. Several countries have announced measures, including spraying chemicals, but it appears it's getting worse with this new report and these new figures released by the FAO. Why is that? The United Nations says the region needs around $76 million to combat the crisis. Officials warn the locust outbreak will spread across the entire continent of Africa and into other parts of the world if action isn't taken. This is a very rare phenomena, but once it does occur, it, it becomes extremely threatening um, to food securities, livelihoods, pastures, and of course, with pastures, if, if herders have to move animals into new areas, that this can be sources of conflict. And just to give you a sense of how big these swarms are, one was spotted in a part of Kenya that contained about 200 billion of these creatures. And in the sky, it occupied a space three times the size of New York City. And as the um, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN has warned, they could increase 500 fold by June if not contained and checked immediately and spread elsewhere. Now, part of the problem is that these locusts are very difficult to track. They move very quickly, but they're not just a scary invasion. They also eat food. Even a small swarm of locusts can consume enough food for 35,000 people and farmers are complaining that about 90% of their crops have already been destroyed. The locusts are now moving towards Uganda and towards South Sudan. South Sudan already under terrible, terrible strain um, from food insecurity. And if you consider that over 20 million people in East Africa are already facing food shortages due to periodic drought and flooding, you have a very serious problem when locusts start eating their only source of food. By April, it's too late because you've then already created this problem. If they get the money soon, then they can start the spraying because the idea is to get the locusts while they're still young and hopping and before that population booms. It's very difficult to track them, but if you can have some kind of surveillance, you can then follow them because these locusts can move about 90 miles in just one day. And climate experts are warning that there's going to be continuing unpredictable weather in the Horn of Africa. And so it's going to be very difficult to anticipate when these locusts may breed again and in such quantities. 
noise is deafening, the stench worse, but locals are powerless to get rid of them unless they break the law. This is just like from a horror movie. And it was like a bat tornado over the town. That's how bad it was. It just seems to me that every bat in Australia is now in England. It's a town under siege. Overrun by bats that outnumber the population by hundreds of thousands. It just stinks. It, it stinks. Infiltrating every corner of the town and putting lives at risk. It's mid-morning in Ingham in North Queensland and in the centre of the normally quiet town there's a cacophony of screeches. The problem that we're having is that we're, we're seemingly being in, uh, influxed by more and more animals and the roost cannot handle it. The botanical gardens are overrun with bats. Every inch of every branch is covered with them. Mayor Raymond Jayo says they've now reached biblical plague proportions. It's a nightmare. It, it is a nightmare. It's truly disgusting. Some of the trees are so full of bats, they're constantly breaking from the sheer weight of them. The bus stop, footpaths, even the town's cenotaph are covered in bat feces. But at night, it's far worse. This is what locals here have to put up with every day. There's hundreds of thousands of bats flying around. The noise is horrendous and the smell is putrid and lingers long after the bats have flown away for the evening. This can last up to an hour and is repeated every morning when they return. If you'd come up here and had a look and had to try to uh, live in this area, it would drive you insane. As the colony grows, so do concerns for local welfare. The bats have recently moved into trees at the local kindergarten and primary school. Well, Indiana State Insect is known for giving off bright flashes of light, creating some dazzling displays at night, but the light of fireflies could soon be going out as that insect faces extinction. Scientists say the loss of natural, ha natural habitat, pesticides, and artificial lighting all play a role. Many firefly fireflies rely on chemical reactions in their bodies to draw them to light and allow them to find mates. Light pollution messes with that cycle. Scientists say their goal is to make land managers and policymakers aware of the threat to keep fireflies around longer. These are all dead birds. These are birds, dead birds. One of them just flew away. Instead of watching them fly in the sky, some people living in this Lee County community of Mount Lachey Isles say these dead birds are showing up on their lawns and streets. Four in your corners, Rachel Lloyd is looking into neighbors' concerns about these birds tonight. Rachel? Now this is just one remaining bird from a cluster of dead birds people found this morning. It's unclear who or what removed the others, but people living here just want to know how they wound up dead in the first place. You can tell by all the bird sculptures that Matt Lachey Isles a pretty animal friendly place. But Ron says it's been a tough weekend walking his dog Groot. He keeps getting distracted and he's not the only one. Well, when I was walking on the next street over, I just looked down and there's this dead bird just laying on the side of the road. We had um, three on another street, Bochelle and Matt Lachey, we had about four. Beatrice Dorino says she's counted up to 20 dead grackles since Friday. It's unusual because it's only here. And for the most part, there's no signs of blood or bruising, except for one case. Yesterday morning, there was one that was slightly alive and a woman tried to get it and it did fly away but she saw a puncture wound so we don't know if it was attacked by something or if it was shot and Frances Martorella has a few ideas of her own I thought maybe somebody's poisoning them 
or they've got a disease or something that's killing them. Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission says they're looking into the issue and until they get to the bottom of it, Motorella is taking matters into her own hands. Literally. She's already collected three from Boat Shell Drive. She says she'll hang on to them to pass off to FWC if they need them. Doves are dying in North Dakota. So we're focusing on our feathered friends who've contracted a deadly virus. And as we report in tonight's top story, the Game and Fish Department is working to document the extent of this disease outbreak. There are still so many unknowns. Why this year? Why? Uh, where did it come from originally? Um, you know, will it be around next year? But state game and fish veterinarian Dr. Charlie Bonson is helping to find those answers. He says the virus was first discovered in the United States in 2009, but until now it had never been reported in North Dakota. It's called pigeon paramyxovirus 1, um, which it's, it's a mouthful, but it's this, this virus that seems to be very specific to primarily Eurasian collared doves, but also pigeons. Uh, maybe morning doves. He says at this point it seems to be specific to the Bismarck Mandan area. In one week there were more than 40 reports, but many more dead doves are coming into this lab. Two more just today. Our first report was from some uh, just concerned backyard bird watchers. Um, you know they noticed a number of Eurasian collar doves that were fine one day and, and dead or near dead the next day. They'll usually have a full crop. They just ate a bunch of food. They've got good fat stores on them, um, so it's really a very fast, acute disease. And as the Game and Fish continues to look for answers, like why the flare-up and why now? Some alarming news today for millions who live along the Great Lakes. The Army Corps of Engineers says three of the five lakes, Michigan, Huron, and Superior, broke January records for water levels. And as Dean Reynolds reports, all that water is now forcing many with waterfront property into a battle to save their homes. The other day, Tish Ganser looked out on the waters of Lake Michigan, the final resting place of her house. Built by her grandfather, most of her lakefront cottage fell off a cliff on New Year's Eve, leaving only a bit of foundation. I just can't believe how much of it is gone. That I'm not a rich person and I really don't know how I'm going to get out of this. With those 10 to 14 foot waves out here. Nick Bonstell, the director of the Ottawa County Michigan Emergency Management Team, noted that the lakes were at or near their lowest point as recently as 2013. Nobody has seen how quick and how much property has been lost in such a short amount of time with this type of erosion. Across the Great Lakes, the inundation has been accompanied by more frequent and intense storms that have stripped away the sandy base of beachfront homes. There's so many wonderful memories. Rita Alton lives in Manistee, Michigan. Her nearly 70-year-old home lies a few feet from disaster. A third of a mile of her property has already washed away. I'm just sitting here waiting for the rest to go down. A desperate effort by homeowners is now underway to move their houses away from the approaching cliffs or build stone barriers to retain the shifting sands below. There's not many options. It's basically uh, do this or lose your home. The last two years were the wettest in more than a century for the Great Lakes, virtually ensuring another season of unusually high water levels that could turn dream homes into nightmares. Well, despite the cold and the snow we saw earlier this week, it has been an especially mild winter, right? Just look outside today. Yeah, no you care. said like the top five, I think, for for us. Yeah, um, in January it was top uh, seven, but overall this overall winter, so far, yeah. overall this winter, second warmest winter wow. on record. We're not the only ones who are seeing such an unusually warm um, period of time, no, right? No, we're, we're, we're not. In fact, there are very few places on Earth that aren't warmer than mm -hmm. normal on average here over recent history, including uh, an area well to our south. You're watching the birth of an iceberg. From a mile away, there's a faint rumble as Antarctica's William Glacier first crumbles, then collapses, a tower weighing thousands of tons toppling into the fjord, then rolling with a torrent of water and ice falling off its sides. The vibrations trigger further ice falls, left and right, 
the camera barely able to keep up. This is a global concern. Take a look at this. Yesterday, Antarctica reached its all-time highest temperature on record, according to Argentina's National Weather Service. While a crewmate filmed up on the bridge of our British Antarctic survey ship, there was astonishment. So as I say, you've got bits of it moving this way. The whole front then moved off to the right. Um, and then it just started another cascade further and further and further down the glacier, at which point we were already turning around to make our way out into, uh, into deeper water because we just really weren't sure exactly how much more of it was going to collapse. But the whole face of the glacier, as you're looking at it now, is a completely different vista to what it was two days ago. But a few hours later, we venture back in. The huge iceberg is grounded on the seabed Offcuts are still splitting and spinning. The blue ice, hardened by the immense pressure of the glacier, is a serious hazard to our ship. We're still around a kilometre from the ice front, but this is as far as the captain dares go, and with good reason. It's impossible to say how much ice has been lost, but five square miles of water are now covered in the debris, air bubbles thousands of years old, popping like Rice Krispies as the ice melts. It's rare to see such significant carving, but over the last 20 years the glacier has retreated by almost a mile. Antarctica has lost three trillion tons of ice over the last 25 years as the planet has warmed. Ice that's rapidly adding to sea levels around the world.